Thanks very much, Sarah, and thank you very much for coming out this evening. And uh, I want to start by saying how uh, delighted and privileged I am to be uh, speaking in my local and favorite bookstore. And I have a very special affection for it because many years ago when I left university, I owned a bookstore, not nearly as nice as this one, but a bookstore in Greenwich in London. Um, and I was for a while a teacher and I, I uh, tried to do both things, teaching and running a bookstore. And through teaching, I, I was a very bad teacher, but I did learn to uh, communicate reasonably. And, uh, but having a bookstore not only um, gave me an opportunity to read a lot of books free uh, <laughs> as the owner, but um, also um, allowed me to interact with readers, real readers, the public. Um, and uh, for an author, that really is a pearl without price. Anyway, I'm really delighted to be here again. Um, I live up the road. And um, so let me start by saying that um, my hope in writing this, in publishing this book, The Mantle of Command, is to um, change the way we think about FDR as Commander-in-Chief in World War II. Uh, let me explain that. After World War II, all the surviving generals and admirals, MacArthur, Marshall, Admiral King, General of the Air Forces, Hap Arnold, Admiral Leahy, the Secretary of War, Colonel Stimson, they all wrote their memoirs recording how they won the war or had authorized biographies written to record their achievements. And among America's allies, it was the same, most notably Winston Spencer Churchill, who having lost his prime ministership in the 1945 election, proceeded to write a six-volume account of how he had won, or masterminded, the winning of the war. A multi-volume magisterial epic composed with the assistance of a veritable army of staffers that won not only the Nobel Prize for Literature, but helped him win the prime ministership back for a second term. Now, President Roosevelt fully intended to write his own account of World War II once the conflict was over. In fact, as the clouds of war darkened in the summer of 1941, he actually began recording his trip to meet Winston Churchill in secret off the coast of Newfoundland aboard two battleships, the USS Augusta and HMS Prince of Wales. But the press of his responsibilities as president and commander-in-chief of the armed forces of the United States made it impossible after Pearl Harbor to continue. And on April the 12th, 1945, only three weeks before the unconditional surrender of the German armies in Europe and four months before the capitulation of Japan, the president died. He was therefore unable to give his side of the story of the terrible conflict, a story which inevitably was then told by others. In the historiographical field, Roosevelt's own perspective thus went unrecorded and underappreciated. Oh, there were many, many books written about the president about FDR as a politician, the president as father of the New Deal, the president as statesman, as diplomat, the president as forester, as stamp collector. But no one stepped forward to record the story of FDR as commander in chief from his perspective. The only book that did attempt a biography of FDR as commander in chief in fact, was called Commander-in-Chief by Eric Larrabee, was written in the 1980s 
after a first chapter about FDR, the rest of the book was devoted to his generals, one by one. We readers, and I count myself among them, thus grew up with a picture of FDR as a great president, but one who largely left the direction of the military prosecution of the war up to his capable admirals, generals, and navy and war secretaries. In the portrait painted by Winston Churchill, moreover, the president is depicted as a marvelously avuncular, generous, and understanding figure who is persuaded by the prime minister to do the right thing, namely, to give Churchill the munitions, the arms, the ships, the tanks, and men that he, Winston Churchill, needs to win the war. After all, Churchill was a born soldier, a direct descendant of the great general, the Duke of Marlborough, a trained officer who'd served in battle since the end of the 19th century in Cuba, in Afghanistan, in the Sudan, in South Africa, in the trenches of the First World War. A political leader, moreover, who prided himself on being a great military strategist, despite the tragedy of the Dardanelles that had destroyed his reputation in 1915. A man who knew war, in other words, to his fingertips, and who saw himself as the obvious man to direct Allied war strategy and operations once the Japanese declared war on America and Hitler followed suit. Now, when I began research for the mantle of command, I didn't contest Churchill's view of President Roosevelt. All the many accounts written by FDR's generals, from MacArthur to Marshall, King to Arnold, Eisenhower to Patton. But I was, which every biographer and historian should be, shall we say, a little skeptical. An American commander-in-chief who largely left the direction of the war to his generals? A commander-in-chief who largely let a foreign prime minister lay down the military strategy? I had a somewhat unusual vantage point as an historian. I had gotten to know Field Marshal Montgomery intimately when I was a student and a young man. Monty had even taken me to Chartwell to meet Winston Churchill at his home, and I'd spend a weekend there with the former prime minister, the last person outside the family to do so. Churchill had been Monty's boss in World War II as Prime Minister and Minister of Defense, thus in all essentials the British Commander-in-Chief. And for more than ten years Monty would talk to me about Churchill, about Churchill as the great leader who rallied his nation after Dunkirk and became a symbol of courageous opposition to Hitler, but also a very flawed Commander-in-Chief a man subject to moods of elation and depression, strategically inept, either underestimating the enemy or overestimating him, and endlessly meddling down to small details such as how many typewriters should be taken to Normandy after D-Day. After Monty's death in 1976, I began a ten-year stint as Montgomery's biographer. <laughs> we, a member of the audience had, I think, one of my books. <laughs> Focusing largely on World War II. And to my own surprise, I think, because Monty was prone to exaggerate, I found Monty's skepticism about Churchill as a commander-in-chief was largely seconded by the historical evidence I found and by the many hundreds of interviews I conducted over those ten years in Britain and here in the United States. Which, when I decided four years ago to make Churchill's portrait of the president as a hands-off, accommodating, 